Thank you, choir, for that beautiful anthem. Would you pray with me? Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that we may hear your word and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'd first like to say a word of thank you to Kathy Gore Chapel, who is Executive Director of Baptist Women in Ministry of North Carolina, for ably and kindly filling the pulpit last Sunday while I was away. I was taking some time to get away, get out of town with some friends. We went to stay near Cades Cove in Tennessee and explore and hike the Smokies together. And I love being in the mountains, and I think I love it because it reminds me of some of the times that I loved as a kid. See, I grew up camping with my family, and and those are some of my favorite memories. We would load up our minivan and a cooler full of food, and we would drive to one of their favorite Missouri campgrounds, usually Sam A. Baker or Johnson shut-ins, and we'd get to our assigned area, and we'd make camp. And my favorite part was always that first night when we were tired from hiking or swimming all day, and my father would make a campfire, and we would make s'mores and roast hot dogs and tell stories long into the night. But before we would go to bed, we would always walk a little bit away from the campfire and look up and stare at the stars, stare at the country night sky that was not polluted by city streetlights. We glance those stars, and I remember in those moments feeling who I was. I got perspective when I got out there and I looked at those stars. That's what the wilderness will get you, by the way, perspective. In many ways, the season of Lent is the time on the church church calendar when we Christians get away to the wilderness. We seek clarity. We seek perspective. It's the time of the year that leads us to Easter, but Lent forces us to pause and wonder before we jump into resurrection. Instead, Lent slows us down. Lent makes camp in our souls. And Lent tells us to stare up at the stars and to realize who we are and who we are not. And here at Ardmore Baptist Church during this season of Lent, we are going to be exploring what does it mean to follow Jesus. And for this first week, Jesus is leading us to the wilderness. In the Bible, the wilderness is a place of testing and formation and danger and life, all somehow blended together. For example, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, they are evicted from the Garden of Eden, and they are sent out into the wilderness. In the book of Exodus, when the Israelites are rescued from slavery in Egypt, before they can enter the Promised Land, they wander for 40 years in the wilderness as they seek God's will about who they were called to be. And here in the Gospel of Luke, in this passage that Bob has so ably read for us, Jesus seems to be drawing on both of these ancient stories. He faces the temptation from Satan as a correction, perhaps, to the way that Adam and Eve failed in the garden. And he goes into the wilderness as a correction, perhaps, as the way the Israelites perhaps failed to truly be God's chosen people. The wilderness is thick with meaning in Scripture. That's why our passage from the Gospel of Luke is is how we begin the season of Lent. In fact, this story serves as the basic biblical story and rationale for the season of wilderness that leads us to Easter. So this first Sunday of Lent is an invitation for us to willingly follow Jesus into the wilderness. And when Jesus goes into the wilderness, he encounters Satan. Now, for most people, even most Christians in the 21st century, 
once you start talking about Satan, they get off the bus. They're okay with this idea of Jesus being a a good guy and a great teacher, but uh, the idea of Satan is often looked at as kind of a primitive, backwards idea. After all, we are progressive, post-enlightenment thinkers. We've moved past such supernatural mumbo-jumbo like the devil. Well, I don't think we should be too quick to dismiss the reality of Satan. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, which is a fictional story about two demons talking to one another, C.S. Lewis says that there are two traps that we can fall into when we think about Satan. The first trap is that we can become obsessed with Satan and think about him all the time. I remember one time at a church business meeting at my previous congregation, one of our microphones was not working. And a woman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I believe Satan caused that mic not to work. I have no idea why Satan did not want the report from the finance committee to be read. And also, Satan was defeated by two AA batteries. Some people are obsessed with Satan, and they see the devil in any roadblock they might meet in this life. And we ought not to fall into the trap of becoming obsessed with Satan and seeing Satan everywhere. And if I can be perfectly frank, sometimes the way that certain Christians talk about Satan, they don't believe in one God. They believe in two. So Satan is a reality, but we ought not to give him too much credit. But the other trap that we that can fall into is that we just outright re- refuse to believe in Satan. And Lewis says that Satan is pleased with either approach. So we should not give Satan too much of our attention and become obsessed, but I think there is wisdom in joining with the ancients in acknowledging that there is a real malevolent force that tries to lead us away from God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies. That's how the devil works in our world. He peddles in lies. That's what the devil did to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He planted planted doubts, he planted lies in their minds about God's good intentions and played to their distorted desire for selfhood and autonomy and freedom. And the early Christians believed that Satan was a real force that would use lies to lead them astray as well. And this story from the Gospel of Luke of of Jesus doing battle with Satan in the wilderness was probably meant to give the early Christians and us a model for how we should deal with Satan in our lives. It's a fairly straightforward story, one that many of you are likely familiar with. Uh, Jesus, Satan comes to Jesus, who's in the wilderness, and, and tells him three lies with three temptations. The first temptation is when Satan comes to Jesus and says, well, you know, turn these stones into bread. That seems pretty innocent to me, doesn't it? After all, Jesus is famished after 40 days of fasting, but Jesus refuses. And he responds to the devil by referencing a passage from Deuteronomy, which reads, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus refuses to believe Satan's lies for a quick fix and instead acknowledges his reliance on God. In the second temptation, Satan takes Jesus to tour all of the kingdoms and all of the governments and all of the nations of the world, and he says, all of this could be yours because it's mine. Which, by the way, might be where the lie comes in. And Satan says, if you will worship me, I'll give it all to you. But Jesus responds by again quoting from Deuteronomy and says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus acknowledges that we worship what we see as powerful, and true power and true worship belong to God and God alone. Jesus refuses to believe Satan's lies about power and instead acknowledges that only God is worthy of worship. 
In the third temptation, the devil takes Jesus to the tip-top of the temple, and he says, throw yourself off of here, and God will protect you. But Jesus refuses, because he knows that testing God to suspend the law of physics by saving one falling person would produce a God of magic tricks. It would present a Jesus so invulnerable that he can jump off of tall buildings and not be hurt. But Jesus is not Superman. And in fact, it is Jesus' vulnerability to suffering and death that later proves that he is truly the Messiah. Jesus responds to the devil by saying that testing God is forbidden. Finally, Satan leaves the wilderness and has been defeated by the Son of God. So how, how did Jesus do it? What tools did he have at his disposal to defeat the devil? Well, Jesus used one thing in particular, uh, Scripture. And that same tool is available to us. We beat the lies of Satan by turning to the truth of the Word of God. But a word of caution before we jump into this. We are not to use Scripture as some sort of magical incantation against the devil as if simply reciting Psalm 23 will make demons fly out of our chest. There is something else, something deeper going on here that we ought to pay attention to. In the 4th century, there was a Turkish Christian monk named uh, Evagrius Ponticus. And he read the story about Jesus being tempted in the desert by Satan, and he was moved and inspired. So he went off to the desert to spend his own season in the wilderness to try to figure out how do you resist the lies of Satan within your own heart. And when he returned from the wilderness, he taught that the primary vehicle for demonic attack, the primary way that Satan gets a foothold in our lives, is through what he calls logos moi, or our thought patterns. Vagrius said that we resist the lies of the devil by literally replacing our thoughts. When we encounter a lie from Satan, Evagrius says that most of us just try to ignore it and, you know, just don't think about it. But we all know you can't do that. Don't think about a purple elephant. What are you thinking about? Evagrius knew that our thought patterns can't just focus on nothing. So, he said, when we encounter a lie from Satan, we give our minds something else to dwell on, namely, Scripture. We replace the lies of the devil with the truth of the Word of God. And by the way, this is right in line with cutting-edge neuroscience. Researchers are currently studying conditions like OCD and addictions, and we are finding that you cannot break those habits simply by telling people, you know, don't do that or don't think about that. You have to form new neural pathways by giving them other things to think about. And when you do this, you literally rewire the brain. If you want to resist the devil... You have to engage with Scripture. But our goal in reading Scripture should never be just information, but always spiritual formation. See, the goal is not to think about Scripture. The goal is to think Scripture. Somebody you know has wronged you in some way. Everything inside of you says that you deserve to hold on to that pain. You deserve to feed that grudge against them because you're in the right and they're in the wrong. Colossians 3, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
You see a politician on television who is blaming all of our country's problems on all those other people. And you begin to feel inside of yourself a growing sense of hatred for those people. And you are tempted to join with this politician and point your finger and lay blame. You're tempted to see all of those other people as the real problem. Galatians 3. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. You find yourself in a hospital room and you feel so alone. You are tired of nurses coming in at all hours of the night to poke you and take yet again another sample. And you have never known this depth of loneliness. Isaiah 43, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. When you lose someone you love in your family, in your church family, and you do not know where to turn with the grief that you carry, John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life Those who believe in me will live even though they may die, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that the answer to all of the complicated things we will face in life is just to, you know, throw Scripture at it. Look, life is complicated. Being betrayed is complicated. Marriage and family are complicated. Politics are complicated. Hospitals are complicated. Loss and grief are complicated. And quoting Scripture at the situations we face in life doesn't erase those complications. I'm not saying we should just read the Bible and you know, that'll solve all our problems. But what I am saying is that what we spend time with forms who we are. Does anyone else on a Sunday afternoon get that annoying reminder on their iPhone that says, this is how long you've looked at your iPhone all week? It's depressing. And studies show that the average American now spends four to five hours a day on their phone. If a child gets a phone at the age of 13, That means if they live a normal lifespan, they will have spent a decade on their phone. The average American watches television for five hours a day. Well, that's another decade. The poet Mary Oliver said, attention is the beginning of devotion. So where is your attention? Or what are you devoted to. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. Boy, you pastors, you just have one note, don't you? Tyler, your brilliant insight into how we resist the devil is just to spend more time reading our Bible. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because make no mistake, friends, you are being formed. You are being formed. The news you choose to watch, the movies you choose to watch, the books you read, the music you listen to, the conversations you engage in, simply walking around in this world, you are being formed. And you have no control over that. The only thing you have control over is what is forming you. I read a story this week about a Ukrainian pastor in Kyiv who has been traveling through the city trying to check on all of his congregation members throughout the city. And he he said that one morning when he started this, he began to have a time of prayer and this, this verse kind of popped up out of nowhere and he read it and it took his breath away. And so now every time he goes to visit one of his congregation members in Kyiv, he reads them Psalm 31 verse 21. Praise be to the Lord, for He showed me the wonders of His love. 
when I was in a city under siege. In the midst of the wilderness of this siege of their city, these Ukrainian Christians are turning to the Word of God. And for all of us, friends, when we find ourselves in the wilderness during this season of Lent, when we are uh, tempted to believe the lies of Satan in our lives, we follow the example of Jesus Christ and we turn to the truth of Scripture that tells us a story of a love so vast that we each are carried from into that story and into a place where we discover who we truly are. Sisters and brothers, on this first Sunday of Lent, what lies from Satan have you allowed yourself to believe? For many of us who find ourselves wandering in the wilderness, we may feel that we have, we have wandered too far from God, that we aren't good enough, we aren't religious enough, we aren't pious enough. But the Word of God says this, in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the truth of who you are, and that is where our joy can be found this Lent in the love of Almighty God. And if Satan doesn't like it, he can sit on a tack. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and loving God, as we begin this season of Lent, as we follow you into the wilderness to be formed into your people. We ask, God, that you would give us open hearts and open minds and open souls to what new thing you want to do within us and through us this season. I pray for all of those gathered here in this room, all of those gathered with us online, that they would know that the truth of the Word of God is that they are loved. In the name of the risen Christ we pray. Amen.